Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, this evening, this morning, this afternoon, uh, wherever you are uh, in the country, around the world. Uh, my name is Gavin Clark with the National Museum of Computing. But uh, for those of us who've been here before, you knew that already. Um, and I'm here with, uh, well, you know why you're here. Uh, on, on no Bhattacharya, I know I've mangled that already. So I, I expect you to correct me later. Um, it, uh, he is, of course, the author of this incredible new book that's come out or released late last year, The Man from the Future, The Visionary Life of John von Neumann, um, which is already a Financial Times and a TLS uh, book of the year, each of those, those publications. Um, we're going to be talking about um, his uh, on and on's book. And uh, it's, a, it's a meaty piece of work. Uh, there's a lot to get into, too much than we could actually possibly even get into here. So many different subjects from a man who, who we'll get into. Before we, we tackle in that though, just gonna set a few um, housekeeping points for everyone. Um, we are, we've got about 45 minutes of chat. We'll just be chatting out the book. Um, please um, so, uh, make a note if you've got any questions, uh, just ask if you keep them until the end so we can just keep on time. And, and just keep the flow going. And we'll definitely open the, the mic as it were to those. Um, the second uh, request is please, if you haven't already, just put yourself on mute uh, for obvious reasons. Be surprised how uh, people do, do forget that sometimes and we get a lot of distractions, but just keep it on mute. And I'm sure everyone it, it will just kind of roll along quite nicely. Um, and I think they, those are all my housekeeping points. I don't even have to do a fire uh, announcement because this isn't a physical event. Cool, okay. So, Oh no! Thank you for joining us this evening. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Pleasure to be here. Thanks. Um, now let's 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 talk about your your book, "The Man from the Future: The Visionary Life of uh, John von Neumann." Um, now, depending on who you are, uh, you people might know John von Neumann. They might have heard of him. Some people might associate his work with the Manhattan Project. Other people, probably especially the uh, some of the people in the uh, our, uh, in our audience, see me were associating with the his work around. Uh, establishing the von Neumann architecture of, com of computers, which we'll come on to later. Um, other people might have fragments of information. Some people might just be here because they've never really heard of this guy, but um, he's a, he, he was, a, a, it's, it's an understatement to say, a brilliant mathematician. He seemed to be one of those amazing people who was fantastic at his work, but loved a, a great martini at the same time. Um, he could come up with game theory, but he could, he could party till four o'clock in the morning with, with his uh, fellow countrymen at a military base in the Nevada desert, it seemed. Um, He's, he's, his fingerprints all over modern life, for example, the, his work on computing and computer architectures. Um, he helped um, seed, not just come up with theory of computing, but seed computers through his quest to find, to, to track down, to, to harness the power of computers. Uh, he came up with all this other stuff. He kind of resolved complex theories in, in mathematics and quantum mechanics. Um, Game theory is attributed to him, which is a huge thing now because because it you know it governs you know people use game theory to govern how websites are constructed and we we interact with each other through through digital and social means and yet and yet he's overlooked, isn't he? Um, he's been overlooked by such giants as um, Oppenheimer, the father of, of the nuclear bomb, and, and Edward Teller, who who worked I think on H bombs. You spent a lot of time. Uh, looking at him here, just in and over, give us a quick sense of who who was he? Did, did you get to the heart of who he was as an individual? Yes, a logician, uh, uh, driven by logic, driven by curiosity, uh, uh, socialite. What kind of who was he? In, in a nutshell, if you had to pin it down. Yeah, um, that's uh, that's a great way to start. Um, so, so the first thing I'm going to do though is. Although you pronounce my name perfectly, um, it's actually John von Neumann. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so I must, uh, so I must uh, sort of draw draw you up on that one. But um, so I think my my, my feeling and uh, what his uh, compatriots um, said about him was that he was a guy who was addicted to thinking, and he was addicted to thinking particularly about maths. And he had this amazing kind of gut instinct, kind of logical core, and then solving them. Sense of which um, problems would turn out to be useful. And, uh, I, I think, I think that's why I see him. Uh, you know, you alluded to the fact that he's not very well known, and I think um, I've been coming back to that again and again. 
I can, I can see some people having uh, dropout problems, unfortunately, with the internet. And um, I think that's because uh, a bunch of my neighbors are currently streaming Netflix or something. I'm sorry about that. Um, but um, so why isn't he um, more well known? And I, uh, the conclusion that I sort of came to is um, whereas people like Einstein, they're, they're known for uh, one or two things. And in, in many ways, von Neumann is um, completely comparable in the scale of his genius. Um, and, uh, you know, one person that I, I spoke to about him compared him to a sort of modern day da Vinci, really, in terms of the scale, the epic scale of his contributions. Um, so von Neumann of almost dabbled and made contributions across such a wide spectrum of um, mathematics that he's very, very difficult to summarize. And so that was kind of my approach, really, to just unpack um, his contributions and, and just focus on the stuff that really seems to matter to us now. I didn't even, I mean, his contributions to pure maths would fill many, many books um, themselves, but I, I really wanted to sort of connect up his ideas and um, relate them to his uh, work as a very young mathematician, you know, 1718, um, uh, which would uh, kind of pave the way uh, in some ways to, to what he did later. Well, did, did you, um, I suppose, did, did you know much about him before you embarked on this book? Did, did you kind of come away with anything, a new sort of fresh perspective on him at all or learn something new you hadn't discovered before? Well, pra practically everything uh, was uh, was new. So uh, the reason that I embarked on the project was that I was a science journalist for 17 odd years. And then I found in the last five, six years, his name just kept coming up more and more frequently in relation to everything from artificial intelligence to evolution, um, to uh, computer simulation with... Um, uh, with the Monte Carlo method, um, it was it was quite incredible. And in fact, um, what happened was one day I just went home and started pulling up uh, books um, from my shelf, all the pop science books. And I found that I think about two thirds of them had his name in the index. And I thought, I know, there's there's got to be a story here, mm -hmm. um, and there was, um, but it was just really rather uh, difficult and uh, complex story that um, then I spent the next uh, three years unpicking and, and writing about. That's three years. It's, it's, it's a ch decent chunk of your life to devote to a, to a subject. Why do, you, um, why do you think then he's been overlooked uh, for all these great achievements? Why do we hear about um, Einstein and Oppenheimer and Teller, but we don't hear about von Neumann? Yeah, it's uh, well, it's it's difficult as somebody who's uh, had been so immersed with him as as I have. But it, it strikes me that the uh, first thing is um, there was a biography uh, of him back in the early ninety uh, early nineties by Norman McRae, but that was very much a uh, a traditional biography that looked more extensively at his personal life and his comings and goings. But I think what was really missing was, um, and I hope I've addressed that to, to some degree, is, a, is an intellectual biography. So something that really sets his work into a modern context. And secondly, I think what's been um, important is just the passing of time. So he's the man from the future now in 2020. Um, but, I, I, but I really think that in the next 10, 15 years, he'll look even more farsighted. Uh, I mean, just uh, last year, towards the end of last year, there was the first report of a genuine um, self-reproducing automata, a little biological robot that was made. And uh, they referred to von Neumann there. And when he came up with his theory, back in uh, the 40s and 50s, everybody thought it was, you know, quite kooky, uh, mathematically interesting, but 
um, and inspirational in some ways later, it would turn out to be, but um, the, the idea of actually realizing these um, self-reproducing automata were, was, uh, which just seemed very uh, uh, a distant prospect. Um, and now we've, we've begun um, to, to produce them. And moreover, his influence on um, stuff like nanotechnology, on the early pioneers of, nano, uh, pioneers of nanotechnology, we're thinking about um, uh, molecular robots that could build other robots. I mean, we know about that now. And uh, back in uh, 1990, that wasn't particularly clear. So I think a lot of things are, are swimming into focus, as it were, now which uh, they weren't then. So he, he now looks like a much more important and bigger figure than he did uh, even back then. Now, having said that, of course, uh, by the time he died, he was incredibly famous. Um, I mean, he was, uh, in America, he was as recognizable um, as Einstein and his, um, uh, you know, any, anything really um, that happened to him if he was, um, appointed to a government position or something, it would be front page news. It's just that uh, in the intervening years, his he, he faded away outside of computer science circles. So. Yeah, you definitely, because you, you noted it, it came through, He because he, he had moved to America in, the in 1930, I think, from Hungary. And um, he kind of moved up and up. He became, I think you noted in your book, the, uh, the most influential mathematician in America at some point, because he was he was involved in all these high powered compute, these circles, ballistics, missiles, um, advisory groups for the government. Obviously, Los Alamos recruited him to work on the Manhattan Project. Um, so was it uh, I mean, his work went before him, his reputation went before him. He became the person to. To bring in, and he got himself in a very sweet spot, didn't he? Because all this came from his work, his initial work on ballistics and missiles, didn't he? When he moved to America in 1930. Um, well, I mean, that was a deliberate move. So he moved from Germany. Actually, he was, uh, I think, he was at the University of Berlin, and then uh, um, he was at the University of Hamburg. He was uh, so at Berlin. He was the youngest lecturer they've ever hired, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but from the 1930s he's getting very strong premonitions that there's going to be another war and he even predicts in a letter that there might be a massacre of European Jews so he doesn't want to really stick around and he thinks his prospects are going to be better in the states and then Princeton sends him um, uh, an offer of a temporary uh, lectureship with an absurd salary attached and he's even allowed to keep his Berlin position uh, going if he wants. So that takes him to America. And then um, quite, in, uh, quite shortly afterwards, the new Institute for Advanced Studies set up. And uh, he's one of the first recruits along with Albert Einstein. He's the youngest as well. So um, I think um, he then realizing that there's a war coming, he, um, uh, takes it upon himself to really um, try to involve himself in useful mathematics. At the same time as, of course, um, carrying on with pure mathematics um, at, a, at a huge rate, his turnover was just incredible. But he became interested in um, nonlinear equations, explosions, and the, and the equations that govern those. And they're um, you know, more or less impossible to solve mathematically, but um, you can sort of come up with approximations and so on. And he, he became a specialist in that sort of area. Mm. Um, um, but um, he also, during this time, slowly develops a reputation as being incredibly lo logical and um, a trustworthy um, advisor to go to when you're in a um, difficult situation. So politicians of um, kind of all stripes really start uh, seeking him out, as well as the army, the navy, and the air force. Um, and so, uh, quite quickly, he begins traveling about from one end of the U.S. to the other, um, and uh, he's a consultant for. Um, 
all parts of the US Army quite quickly. Um, and so, and, and as a result of that, he's sent on this top secret mission um, to help the Royal Navy in, I think it's 1940. And um, he's, he helps the Royal Navy uh, decipher German submarine uh, mine laying patterns. And he solves that quite quickly. And then at the end, and that, that visit's cut short, six months in when he gets a, a letter from or in destiny of his help. And he, he, he can't tell von Neumann uh, what he wants him for. He just describes it as a Buck Rogers type of project. And of course, it's the Manhattan Project. And okay. uh, so von Neumann um, is recalled and gets involved with that. Now, it's interesting because obviously he gets recalled to this Buck Rogers project, but it wasn't really his first, I suppose, it wasn't the first time computing and computers had kind of been calling to him because he has a, there's, a, there's an Alan Turing angle on this, on his evolution as well. And of course, we, you know, we can conjecture as much as you know, they influence each other. But um, Turing's, because Turing was in America in 1937 when he came out with his famous um, on computable numbers uh, with an application to the Enschlichtung problem, um, which was quite seminal. And then um, I believe um, uh, von Neumann read it and he was impressed. But in fact, he was studying in Princeton and, and, and von Neumann offered Turing a job, didn't he? And then they came to their paths. We th now, this is what I wasn't clear on. Did their paths absolutely cross again or was it just conjecture? They, they met again in, on, on von Neumann's visit to the Ukraine in 1942 because that was, wasn't, I wasn't quite, didn't quite get that part. Yeah, so um, there's no evidence that they did meet in 1940. Interesting, um, because Alan Turing is a big John von Neumann fan. And, uh, and, and this goes back to his school days. So when Alan Turing was awarded a prize at school for winning a maths competition, he asked for his prize uh, for a copy in German, mind you, of von he writes to his mum saying, um, you know, that it's it's uh, this is a fascinating book and it's it's really not at all difficult. <laughs> um, and so, you know, to the 18-year-old uh, uh, Alan Turing, at least, if you're a genius, it's not too difficult. I've uh, I had a slightly tougher time with it. Um, was this one? Was this his, his nineteen twenty eight book, the Mathematical Foundations? Of yeah, Quantum. that's right. That's right. So he he laid. Um, the first really rigorous um, mathematical description of quantum mechanic, uh, mechanics, which again is something that really he's over he's overlooked for and uh, is not talked about. But um, in many ways, at least when it comes to a, a description of atomic physics, I mean his maths is still pretty central. And if we're talking about say the quantum computers of the future, and we're talking about how do you assemble or can you assemble large ensembles of um, entangled, um, I don't know, electrons or photons or, or whatever. Uh, some of the philosophical questions go back to uh, some of what von Neumann was writing about back in, you know, the, the, the 20s and 30s. Um, so, so going back to Turing, so he, he has this copy of von Neumann's book and then Turing's very first paper in 1935 develops work in John von Neumann's 52nd paper, which is on group theory. So they're not really talking about computing, um, but they, they both have this strong interest in mathematical logic. Now, in that year, in 35, when Turing's paper comes out, um, uh, von Neumann's in Cambridge, and it's very likely in 35 that they did meet, but even if they did, because they, they were talking about the same thing, the same sort of maths, and von Neumann was pretty impressed by Turing's paper on group theory. Um, even if they didn't meet, what we know is that Turing wrote to von Neumann asking him for a reference to come to Princeton, uh, to the, um, yeah, to Princeton to start his PhD. And uh, Turing was looking for funding. And um, thanks uh, to von Neumann, he did indeed get funding and did his PhD at Princeton. And so 
he would have just been at that time, he would have been along the corridor from von Neumann. And when he arrived in Princeton, yep, we know that he got his um, uh, drafts of uncomputable numbers um, in which he discusses this um, machine. Uh, well, it's not a machine, it's a computer, but by computer, he was still talking about uh, people. Um, uh, at, and at the time, it was female people who were who were computers. And uh, he envisages um, a computer that can then compute anything, um, a general purpose uh, computer. I mean, we now, um, many, many years later, we consider that to be a very theoretical description of a um, stored program, uh, programmable modern computer. Mm. But of course, nobody saw that at the time. Um, and von Neumann, years later, would tell his engineers to read the paper. Um, but whilst he was busy with computing, which uh, comes later, um, it's not at all clear that um, Turing's work was at the forefront of his mind, although all of the wider wor work on logic that he did, um, including Turing, including most very importantly, Kurt Gödel, Gödel's work, um, all of this um, work that, that the mathematicians at the time were doing on the Entscheidungsproblem, Hilbert's um, completeness problem, this was incredibly important to the development of the computer because for the first time people started thinking about what is and what is not computable um, in step-by-step -step algorithmic um, terms. So you know, as far as we know, that's how Turing uh, fits in. And then later, of, of course, Turing does this incredible work in co-breaking and um, he uh, an artificial intelligence. And then uh, when he drafts um, his plans for the, uh, for uh, I think it was uh, for the ACE computer, he actually references Turing, uh, von Neumann's really important uh, report, which is the first draft of, of the EDVAC, which I guess we shall come to now. <laughs> we'll come on to, yeah. I noticed you mentioned uh, uh, Tony Gifford who was head of Britain's National Research Development Corporation said that Turing and von, von Neumann sparked off each other, that they kind of, they could kind of like, you know, they could complete, uh, almost like complete each other's sentences, but, you know, one could imagine one half of a computing or, you know, a mathematical problem, the other would imagine the other half. So it seems like they did have this kind of chemistry between them. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not clear um, how much uh, of that was based on, uh, you know, what, what Gifford had actually, known or whether these two guys met up again but they i mean it's they certainly got on and um they they admired each other um i guess that what is at issue really historically is um whether turing's early work had some sort of tangible effect on the development of the modern programmable computer and it's um not very clear that it did mm -hmm. so well, let's come back to um, look back to Los Alamos and the influence that had on because this this is kind of the catalyst. I guess it was possibly the biggest of the data problems of that era. Um, in the you know trying to predict the nature of explosions is is a, is a, the, the dynamics was a difficult thing, and obviously it was a, a huge time for uh, ballistics. Um, and obviously they're trying to build one of the biggest, which is the the nuclear bomb. Um, Los Alamos, I think you in your in your book you referenced they brought in about um at one point they had 10 IBM punch card machines um to kind of crunch the the, the data on, on Teller's fission bomb. And also they were using uh, like you said, uh, wives of the scientists, where uh, women were computers, they were calculating using hand-powered cal calculators on a desk to, to crunch this data. But the project was too big, and especially successive projects were too big, they couldn't keep up with with the data either in conventional explosives or even nuclear or hydrogen explosives. So it seems like von Neumann got it. He, this is where the light bulb moment seems to have gone off. Look, computers are, are the answer. 
doesn't it? I mean, that's, this seems to where it, it, it seems to be his switch from, I think you said in the book, his switch from um, theoretical math, mathematics to practical, in a way, mathematics. Yeah, I, I think um, it's probably an underappreciated fact and uh, maybe not a pleasant one at how closely the history of the modern computer is intertwined with, uh, with warfare. Uh, of the most brutal sort. So yeah, so at, at Los Alamos, they were running out of computing um, resources, basically. And von Neumann, with his interest in, in computing, um, was um, essentially appointed as, as their sort of head of head of computing. And so he was scouring the country, looking for more computing resources. Now, um, initially, this was to perfect the design of the, the fission bomb, the atom bomb. And then later it was to try to help design the, the fusion bomb. And that was Teller's super um, design. And it would turn out that Teller's initial design was wrong and um, the computing that we're, we're gonna discuss later would help to show that it would never have worked. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, in a, towards the end of the war, despite running around between the computers that he was told about and he knew about, um, he discovers uh, the ENIAC, which is going to be the first um, electronic digital uh, computer. And he discovers it by, quite by accident. He, he's standing on the platform uh, of a railway platform um, of Aberdeen Station, I think on the way back uh, from one of his consulting things. And uh, Herman Goldstein, who's a mathematician, but also a military man, um, sees him and recognizes him and sidles over and, and starts to chat. And he reveals he's the military liaison for this, for the ENIAC, for this incredible computing project. And the ENIAC is being built for one reason and one reason only, and that reason is to compute um, artillery trajectories, as you as you said earlier. So this was a huge problem during the First World War, and uh, it hadn't gone away by the Second World War. So it was to, the idea was to try and predict how how you know what angle to fire cannons at, and so on to to make your projectiles uh, land in the right place and blow buildings and people up properly. Um, so the ENIAC was being built at the Moore School to address that problem. And uh, von Neumann is immediately drawn into the project. So Goldstein's a huge von Neumann fan as well, draws him into the project. And as soon as he arrives, um, uh, von Neumann helps the project get funding for the next type of computer, the EDVAC. Um, and um, now, the ENIAC is, was invented by uh, Morchley um, and Eckert. And uh, Morchley was a physics teacher and um, he was interested in electronics. And he, it was the whole of the, the ENIAC up until that stage was his idea. Mm -hmm. And Eckert was this master, a young master um, engineer of electronics. So they were aware of the ENIAC's limitations. So um, every time you wanted to reprogram the ENIAC, you would have to um, take cables out and plug them in elsewhere. You'd have to, a bit like an old fashioned telephone exchange, you would have to sort of um, uh, put, put plugs in to different places so that you could run another program, which was quite unwieldy. They all realized this, but what von Neumann then did was to show how you could design a, what we now think of as a modern programmable computer. And he sketched this out in the most um, kind of abstruse seeming terms. So in the EDVAC report, um, he describes uh, the architecture of the modern computer using um, these artificial neurons, um, which were uh, in, sort of uh, it was, uh, 
discovered these were made up by two mathematicians, McCulloch and Pitts, and those artificial neurons uh, were really the first stage towards what uh, to the, towards the neural networks of today. They were um, they they worked uh, at a, at a crude as a crude approximation of real neurons. They fire when they reach a certain threshold and start a signal. And he described it in those terms because a uh, people thought of electronic computers as basically giant brains and uh, you know we don't we don't mind calling um, computer storage computer memory even today um, and so that's a bit of a hangover from that time but also because um, he wanted to really get down to the logical essentials of what this machine was and according to historians like Thomas Haig who've looked into this whilst people realized there was a need for a um, a sort of general purpose thought program computer, nobody had really elucidated the architecture of those. And in the EDVAC report, von Neumann describes um, this in kind of modern terms. So the, the, the key thing is that there's going to be a massive memory and it's going to store programs as well as numbers, which had not happened before. And then uh, one by one, the, the, the central processor will execute those commands um, line by line from the program that's stored in memory. And there's an, um, an arithmetic unit um, that will uh, you know, do, do the sums. And then it, you know, these instructions run backwards and forwards from the CPU. And it's the, that's the basis for pretty much um, all modern computers today, from smartphones to this laptop um, that I'm talking to you on. Let's uh, um, come on to it about in a sec, but I was kind of curious about um, something. There was a very vivid moment in the book where he, he seems to have had this um, moment of self-doubt, wasn't there, uh, where he came back from working in Los Alamos and he, was, he seemed to have been infected by the work on the nuclear bombs. And he thought it was going to make the scientists the most hated uh, people in the, in the world. But then he also started talking about the potential of computers, but also in a sense of computers are even potentially more dangerous. And then his wife at that time, uh, Clary, Clary um, basically told, say, go, have a, gave him a, a whiskey and a couple of pills to get, go to sleep. But he seems to have this, this amazing, insightful moment about the power, but also the risk. And I wonder whether um, he was motivated by that to that almost fear of computers to try and maybe tame them, turn them, to, turn them to good rather than let them run out of control and become the monsters in, in that moment you thought they might become. Yes, I mean, um, this, is, this is one of the key moments, yeah. So one thing that we, so what happened was that von Neumann came home from Los Alamos one day um, in the morning at about 11 and uh, Cl Clary says he went straight to bed with no lunch, which already got her worried because he was a man who liked lunch. And um, he goes to he goes to bed and he sleeps for sort of 12, 14 hours straight and gets up in the middle of the night and starts burbling and uh, at this and stuttering and uh, talking at this frenetic rate and gets Cl Clara quite, quite worried. Um, so um, he is mortally terrified. Um, that there will be a third world war. Now, given his prescience in um, understanding that there was a second world war coming, you can understand that when he'd had that confirmed, he, you know, he and he imagined that there would be a third nuclear war. Um, you can then make much more sense of what um, his views were to be later. Mm. Um, on uh, es essentially he for a few years after the Second World War when the US had dominance um, in terms of uh, atomic weapons um, he advocated a preemptive strike on Russia if they didn't submit um, to um, uh, giving up their nuclear ambitions as it were to either the US or some sort of world government or, or something like that and um, and this has got him a reputation as uh, as Dr. Strangelove. And I think that's one of the other reasons that we tend to overlook von Neumann now. We regard him as this um, 
ruthless and callous um, cold warrior. But I think what's overlooked is that um, he, um, his childhood was um, turned upside down by a communist regime in Hungary, and then an even more brutal um, a sort of counter-revolutionary nationalist force uh, that was uh, led by um, led by a general, which uh, you know butchered people on the streets, and then um, he moves to Germany, and he finds it in many ways this perfect sort of intellectual setting, um, and then, of course, with the rise of Hitler, that is turned upside down, and he's from a Jewish uh, family, even though um, he and his brothers converted to Catholicism uh, when um, their father passed away. He's um, you know, uh, many of his friends and uh, family were threatened by all of this. Many of them ended up in concentration camps. And um, he hated authoritarianism. He was as suspicious um, of uh, Stalin and um, Stalin's Russia as he was of the Nazis. And so he thought, you know, Stalin had to be stopped really um, at any cost. And he knew far earlier than anyone else that the, um, the Soviet Union were pursuing nuclear bombs and they were pursuing intercontinental ballistic missiles. And in fact, they were ahead of the US um, as we, was in, we now know, they sent Sputnik up. And um, they're, um, so I think if we understand these comments mm. in that context, then that makes it clear. So he wakes up from this, uh, th this vision of, uh, of doom and starts talking about nuclear power. And he says, you know, it will make scientists hated worldwide, but it will also make scientists into the most uh, desired people on the planet by, by governments. And then he starts talking about the future of technology and um, his bigger fear and also hope is computing and computers and, and the march of technology. And he's the first later to use the word singularity in that context of kind of exponential gains in technology, far outracing our ability to imagine um, uh, that progress um, and perhaps even to control it. And uh, so he was kind of very prescient on, uh, on that score again. Well, it's interesting. Let's come back, um, loop back to the, um, because this brings me on to the back to the Edback report, um, the first draft, um, and for two reasons. One is it's seen as being this kind of like seminal piece of work, I suppose, um, but it is, but um, there were great chunks of it. There were, there were holes in it. It was, not, it was unfinished work and there wasn't a part two of it. He kind of just left it and yeah, it was seized upon um, as kind of, as you know, as it was enough to kind of get people started. But what I thought was fascinating was the uh, the controversy around it because um, for whatever reason he didn't credit um, Eckhart and Mulchley in it and they got really seriously uh, burned and really uh, upset by this and it turned the tidges I believe it turned into a long running court case um, and it seems to be um, in a way uh, he seems like he wanted to get establish the elements of computers and computing in the community to uh, assist the development of computers. Um, it seems to be, I get the sense, and he almost says this, I wanted to keep as much of the technology in the public domain as I can. Um, he didn't want, he wanted to contribute to clarifying and coordinating the thinking and to further the art of building high speed computers. What he seems to have feared, it seems, whether as a crime of omission or a deliberate act, he didn't want the computing architecture, which he was going to map out, to become locked into years of patent disputes, which um, uh, which happens in the United States, as we all know, by these two people. So I wonder if you could, uh, by Mortley and Eckhart, I wonder if you could just address that for a bit. How how much did he kind of, could we see him as a, an early open sourcer? And was it maybe motivated by the sense of get out there to as many people as possible to humanize and, and, and tame this technology, there's this new machine? Yeah, I absolutely argue for that in the book. I, I think he should be in many ways considered this sort of unacknowledged grandfather really of the open source movement, which only took off, I think, um, 
a dec in the 60s, a decade or so after his death, um, this uh, this idea of open sourcing. So um, just spinning back to the EDVAC report. Now, um, von Neumann um, wanted the report to be circulated, but the ENIAC was top secret at that time. So that's another reason why he used this rather abstruse um, uh, McCulloch and Pitts neuron and why he beat around the bush um, about the whole thing. And in fact, the only citation in the whole of the uh, EDVAC report is to the McCulloch and Pitts paper, which described these neurons. So he's being a bit cheeky, but um, he didn't actually circulate the EDVAC report. That was Goldstein, and it was done without the knowledge or permission of um, von Neumann, um, and more importantly, of Morchley and Eckert. Now, it's quite clear that Morchley and Eckert were very keen to make money off their invention, and who could blame them? Um, and they wanted to take patents out. Now, in a sense, um, the EDFAC report is a bit of a red herring. Um, there's been a great deal of fuss about it. And the whole Eckert and Morchley court case lasted for decades. And in the end, the court concluded that, um, yes, the EDVAC reports meant that they couldn't patent it, but there were other reasons too. Um, one of them being that Morchley had um, seen an electronic computer, very primitive um, electronic computer, as it turned out, but he had seen one and that had triggered um, some of his thinking on uh, the ENIAC. All of this is very, very controversial. Um, and um, I, I don't really draw a conclusion on it. But really, I think uh, the reason I say it's a red herring is that although the EDVAC report was important, what was more important is what happened next. So the team kind of split after the EDVAC report um, and uh, von Neumann um, raised funding at the Institute for Advanced Study to build his own computer there. And whilst he was building it with Goldstein and a, um, a bunch of engineers, they started putting out progress reports on um, how to build, how they were building this computer. Now it took them a very long time to build the computer and by the time they'd finished, they'd been overtaken. But these progress reports were absolutely key. He was sending them out all over the world to every major group that was trying to develop computers. And in material terms, it was these reports, really, rather than the EDVAC report, um, which um, led to the first generation of proper programmable uh, stored program uh, computers. And um, uh, von Neumann, again, to much more um, acrimony with uh, um, Morchley, um, he was hired as a consultant by IBM. And IBM's first commercial computer, which I think was the, uh, the 501, uh, was basically a carbon copy of the IAS machine, um, according to the IAS, engineer, IAS yeah, engineers, anyway. Um, and so um, I, I, I guess they, there you have it. Um, uh, so, you know, really um, the EDVAC report is considered the sort of birth certificate of the modern computer, but um, what actually was the tangible um, influence and the tangible route appears to have been those, um, how, how do you do it type reports that mm -hmm. Goldstein and, uh, and von Neumann put out. It's fascinating. There's almost like one of those accidents of history. If had Goldstein held out, had he not published, had he not been so enthusiastic and petulant, where would, where his motives were, if we, do, if we know what they were, that you know it, history might have been different. Um, Eckert and Morsi might have got their patents. You know, they might have, and and the history of computing might have been different. Just what do you think? Um, I'm just going looking at the time, and if people got some questions, if they could just start lining them up, that'd be great. Um, just want to just turn briefly to Clara because yes. um, if, if John um, had kind of established this kind of like they say he open sourced this architecture in quote marks, and he did so much work, he, he took this journey. Um, his second wife ran, um, not only uh, turned 
um, ENIAC into a, a modern stored program computer. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of discussion around this because Manchester Baby is considered the first one. Um, uh, she, she not only worked on that project, um, and she did so at great cost to her, I suppose, her mental and physical health. Um, she she um, coded the first programs, these Monte Carlo programs, didn't, uh, simulations to, to test Teller's bomb. If you could just talk about her importance and her contribution here to, to creating the first program to run on this, this first stored program computer. Yeah, she's she's an incredible figure. So she comes from an, you know another wealthy Jewish Hungarian family. She's his second wife. And uh, they first meet in Monte Carlo by, by coincidence in the early 1930s when von Neumann is um, uh, allegedly trying out a fail-safe a system for the roulette wheels. And um, of course, he loses all his money. And uh, Clary, who's married to her first husband at this time, is an inveterate gambler, um, buys him a drink and they start chatting and they get on like a house on fire. But she's married and um, so is he. So they go their separate ways. And then they uh, meet again in the late 30s. And von Neumann's divorce is just coming through. And this time, Clara is married to her second husband, who is much older than she is, and uh, I think a banker and in incredibly wealthy. But uh, again, they get on like a house on fire. They start meeting in cafes, having, having drinks. And, and she tells her husband that um, she would like a divorce. Um, Clary herself, um, uh, Clary herself um, is um, a teenager. She's a, a national champion of figure skating. And um, she's sent off to boarding school in England, but essentially all her education stopped after school. And, uh, you know, during the war, von Neumann's crisscrossing the country and their relationship is really shaken by all of this. I mean, she's, um, she's quite insecure um, and clearly very, very smart, but she's constantly surrounded by, you know, some of the, you know, sharpest minds um, in the country and her husband's constantly away and they're, they're writing and there's these passionate but also um, heartbreaking letters and telegrams between them as von Neumann's flitting between Los, Alam Los Alamos and, and various other parts of, uh, of the US. Mm. Um, to, at the end of the war, finally, Los Al uh, finally von Neumann can tell her what, she's, uh, what he's been up to during the war. And, um, and then he invites her to Los Alamos to have a look around. And, uh, you know, he tells her, bring, bring your ice skating stuff. There's a great frozen pond and the opportunities are great. And um, Clara loves Los Alamos. She loves the atmosphere. There's a bunch of Hungarians there. It's the same sort of high bourgeoisie, um, the same sort of party atmosphere that she's used to growing up in, in Hungary. So in the middle of the desert, she kind of rediscovers Budapest really and um she's uh, she gets fascinated with computers and um so um stan ulam come with von neumann has come up with this idea of monte carlo simulations a complete coincidence um that it's called monte carlo but um the idea of monte carlo simulations is instead of trying to compute a definite answer to a complex problem, you essentially run the problem over and over again with um, a particular example and then see what the answers are. So Ulam uh, came up with the idea whilst he was convalescing in a hospital and he was playing patience. And he started, he was supposed to not really be taxing his brain, but he, he can't resist. And so he starts trying to calculate what the probabilities are of winning any particular hand of patience. Uh, a solitaire, sorry, uh, same thing, but uh, but different. And um, he realizes the calculations are too difficult. And then he thinks, well, what if I just play out, say, a hundred hands, and um, try and reach some sort of statistical infer inference about what the probabilities of winning are? And that's really where Monte Carlo starts. Mm -hmm. And von Neumann um, then um, writes this computer program using. The, um, the Monte Carlo method. He doesn't write the program, sorry, he, 
he um he sort of looks at the mathematics and he designs the mathematics of this and says that it could be a program a computer program uh, of running um uh, neutrons in a an atom bomb and what what would the path of um a neutron be and then you can look at the different materials inside the bomb and try and maximize you know the explosion and it's clary that we now know thanks to the work of historian uh, thomas haig and his colleagues that wrote those uh, first codes and they ran um uh several weeks or months before uh, the Manchester baby cycled through its first um, program, which was um, to find the highest factor of 262,144, um, uh, which, um, and, the, and, the, and the contrast here is quite incredible. Uh, I mean, Clary's program was an 800 command program that was designed to um, optimize atom bombs. Um, and within that program, um, there's, a, there's a closed subroutine. Now, a closed subroutine is a type of loop that's executed whenever it's referenced from the main body of a, of a computer program, very common today. The invention of that closed subroutine is usually credited to David Wheeler, um, a computer scientist. But Clary's code, we now know, made use of one at least a year earlier. And uh, it was used to generate the random numbers that Monte Carlo needed by von Neumann's method of middle squares. Now, <clears throat> the uh, the Manchester Babies is uh, supposed to be the first, sort of, um, I think, stored program, programmable computer. Now, once uh, von Neumann had the EDVAC report, what he realized is that you know his computer was running way behind schedule and they wouldn't get it. So he thought, why don't we try and convert the ENIAC into a sort of stored program computer? And um, that is uh, also what Clary did. So she turns up um, with um, uh, one of the scientists from Los Alamos, uh, Metropolis um, was his name, and they coordinate the rewiring along with uh, the band of programmers, again, um, all women who were working on the ENIAC originally. And so arguably, um, the ENIAC in this configuration is a modern stored program computer and the first of many to come. And Clary's 800 um, uh, line, uh, code that she ran is, is arguably the first uh, modern computer program in the sense of it ran on a, for, on a stored program computer. But it's certainly the first really complex modern um, code that we know of, I believe. It's certainly compelling. I noticed we had a, a question there from Christine Arrowsmith, who's, who's in the comments. She's a demonstrator of the replica Manchester Baby. So she's wondering when uh, the Manchester Baby fitted into that. I, and I kind of, I don't know if that's answered your question, Christine, um, but it certainly does change. Uh, it makes us rethink history uh, and it's certainly interesting. I wonder, it's remarkable considering, especially um, again, the, her background educated in to what we call a high school level, um, she'd had some experience in, in I think, uh, in Princeton, in the administration there, in some mathematics or map reading, I, I forget. But it, it was it was almost like it was it was the personal introduction of von Neumann, John, that got her the gig, wasn't it? Otherwise, it couldn't have happened. It it was, although she she was much more than an administrator. So she was involved in uh, population dynamics research yeah. at Princeton. Uh, working and it's uh, it was a really uh, well regarded unit there and they were um, uh, trying to predict the ebb and flow of post war populations around Russia so it's highly mathematical and there are some comparisons that uh, you could make between kind of the random movements of neutrons within a bomb and the random flux of populations that they were also looking at between countries post-war. Um, and she did amazingly well by all accounts in her, in her job, um, so much so that Princeton actually offered her um, a uh, offered a tenure, which she turned down. 
and uh, then she started working on the um, on the ENIAC codes with her husband. So yeah, that's where they are. Uh, I can see lots of questions coming up, and uh, many of them are really interesting. <laughs> so maybe we should. Uh, Let's just test that just how much you know. All right, then. Um, Sheridan asked us, um, what random number algorithm did Clara use for her Monte Carlo method? Come on. Yeah, so this this was called the method of middle squares. And von Neumann came up with it. And um, uh, if I remember rightly, it's to do with squaring a number um, and then using the middle number out of the binary or, the, uh, or whatever number that you got out as your random number and then squaring that again, um, squaring the whole number again to come up with the next one. It's of course, you know, um, I think von Neumann himself uh, said that anybody who tries to uh, uh, find uh, random numbers through a, uh, through a mode of calculation is in a state of sin. So um, he, he clearly knew that there were um, limitations to this method. Um, but it works really rather well, um, and it, it worked uh, well enough for for him and for plenty of other applications uh, after after that. Okay, and then Christine is 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 has responded. Um, we say uh, we say the baby was the first stored memory computer. Also, there are only seven commands available at that time. I don't know how that uh, how that changes things, um, or whether I guess this is all part of the debatability of what of which came first. Yeah, was that sorry? I, I missed that. Was that the Manchester baby? I only had yes. Yeah, uh, Christine yeah. says uh, we we tend to say baby was the first stored memory computer. Also, there are only seven commands available at that time. Yeah, um, where, whereas um, the ENIAC, I believe, in its reconfigured state, Clary and um, Metropolis had around seventy commands, and it was uh, you know genuinely from those seventy commands you could. Um, you could do, I think, practically anything. It was a proper universal machine. So, yeah. Um, we've got another question here. This uh, ENIAC, um, you, uh, this is a question from um, Juiced, uh, and he says, uh, you mentioned something about a patent not being granted for ENIAC um, and uh, because Eckhart saw an electronic computer. I think um, that was, um, yes, I think that is, that's just to sharpen that. I think that's because... That comes down to the legal case, doesn't it? Where yeah. it's found you couldn't. First of all, they they didn't pass anything in the year after the invention when they were allow, allowed to. But secondly, um, he he went and he went and visited this other professor who had his own computer. So therefore, discussion of where he got the idea from. So a, a patent could possibly have not been granted on that basis. Yeah, that's right. So it so this was the last turn of the knife really it's it's Morchley yeah. it was Morchley's pet yeah. and I do I mean everything I've learned about Morchley did make me feel very sorry for him but I have to say that he then then did go on and have a pretty good career in computing and um, uh, producing uh, you know the bigger mainframes and, and so mm. on but uh, but what happened is there was this decades long court case during which, of course, you know, von Neumann was unable to participate because he was dead. Um, and um, so what this concluded with was, yes, um, the Edback report, um, which was in circulation from mid 1945, had divulged the ideas needed to build an electronic digital computer. But um, uh, they had also undone themselves because they had trumpeted to the New York Times um, in February 1946 that, their <clears throat> um, that the ENIAC was working satisfactorily. Um, unfortunately, they only filed patents in June 1947, which was more than 12 months later. And according to US patent law, that's too late. You have to file your patents within 12 months of um, having um, demonstrated a working um, machine. And then lastly, it turned out that um, uh, Morshley had paid a visit um, to um, Iowa State College. And if you look on Iowa State's site, they're still very proud of this. Um, there was a computer called the uh, Atanasoff Berry computer, the ABC computer, and it was tiny. It comprised 280 triodes, 
and it stored binary numbers using 3000 capacitors mounted on a pair of these rotating drums. Uh, and it was basically this tiny thing. Um, but, um, uh, you know, uh, Morshley had visited him, uh, we know that, had taken a very strong interest in this device that they'd come up with. And it had probably inspired him in some way to then go mm. off and build this massive room filling ENIAC, which truly is a, a uh, you know, was his creation. Um, and the court ruled, um, unfortunately, that he um, <laughs> he uh, um, he had uh, not then invented an electronic, the first electronic uh, computer, because it had all been done before yeah. by uh, uh, an art, uh, an artist, uh, a Tarnasov, um yeah. at Iowa State, uh, and it's a fact that Iowa State is very proud of today. Well, it's another interesting facet, this kind of league with this controversy and the Athensoft computer. Um, somebody, Rob Walker, did ask this question and showed and sort of answered it. it was, but I was kind of wondering what you thought as well. Uh, Conrad Zeus, uh, any kind of, did, did von Neumann have any kind of uh, interaction or awareness of what Zeus was up to at all? No, I, I, I don't think he did. Um, Zeus was, of course, busily building computers um, before then. I'm not an expert on Zeus. I do know that... Um, there were claims made for Conrad Zeus's computers as being, um, uh, you know, um, general purpose uh, sort of machines. But um, uh, in material terms, he never envisaged them to be these general purpose machines. They were, they were again, built for one purpose. And they, um, to, to rewire them into um, kind of stored program computers, um, would have been, um, you know, in theory, you could do it. And somebody showed how in theory you might have done it. But um, in practice, they would have been so unwieldy and slow that, you know, nobody uh, would have got anything useful out of them. So it's really, uh, it really, in terms of the modern stored program computer, um, you know, like, like so many things, it was brilliant work. Mm -hmm. But um, in terms of tangible um a real life impact on the modern stored computer um they didn't uh, have much i think it was fascinating just kind of i suppose looking back um things like that and also ENIAC um uh, which was an edvac which they kind of worked towards were quickly quickly overtaken all the hard work and and discovery that went into building them were quickly usurped and, and passed over by a succeeding generation of faster leaner computers and you know it's just interesting how that dynamic is still true today well, well, to be fair, it, it, you know, the ENIAC had a longer lifetime than this laptop will that I'm talking to you on. Um, so um, that's because it's been kept in a museum on Smithsonian, I think. <laughs> so um, uh, they uh, so so in its um, uh, rewired mode, um, the ENIAC was useful for several years to to come, and it was pretty much constantly used. And of course, one thing that I didn't mention is that. Um, uh, the reason that the EDVAC report and uh, the, the, the subsequent um, von Neumann architecture became so influential is because it was simple. Mm. I mean, the original uh, plan, uh, you know, the original ENIAC was really quite complex and needed a lot of uh, these uh, valves, which would keep, keep inconveniently blowing, and and so on, and so really, um, ENIAC. Uh, so uh, von Neumann's um, uh, the von Neumann architecture uh, allowed you to um, have this extremely efficient computer that could do you know then could do anything, and wasn't constantly breaking down. And uh, I think, you know, I'm not a computer scientist or a computer um, engineer, but I think that's one of the reasons that it, it really took hold was the reliability. It has plenty of drawbacks, yeah. uh, of course, you know, this serial one by one chuntering um, approach that we still see the consequences of um, uh, on, our, on our computers today, uh, the drawback. But, um, uh, you know, this was a key advantage. Well, just on that note, and just wrapping up, I noticed you put some interesting statistics in there on ENIAC. I think it was uh, troubleshooting was about 41% of the time, and it only dedicated about every week, about 4 or 5% of the time was actually spent on actual computing work itself. So it was a quite, a, quite a lot of overhead. And then he, 
Uh, von Neumann came in and he, as, you, as you say, he was able to cleave problems of their superficial complexities and, and render them down to the most elemental form, which is, which is what he did with the computer. You know, he stripped away the, the crud. Um, that, that's right. I just saw another question pop up. I'm sorry, I can't resist. Jim, yeah. yes, my book does indeed deal with game theory. There's a chapter about it. It deals with um, uh, it deals it deals with all of the uh, major practical accomplishments that von Neumann um, got up to. So uh, computing, uh, game theory, um, the foundational crisis, which all kicked it all off. Um, uh, his impact on the Cold War later in RAND um, uh, and uh, reproducing automata and that the impact of that on uh, nanotechnology and um, and all sorts of other things, self-reproducing probes and things like that. So it's a bit of a, a dance through von Neumann's ideas and their impacts. Yeah, please do buy it. <laughs> Uh, you took the words right out of my mouth. I was about to say um, there was a lot. There was a lot of material we could have touched there, and there's a lot much we, we have not been able to come, even get close to. Um, I'd encourage you to uh, go out and uh, buy on those book. Uh, you can of course get it from all leading booksellers, but especially I encourage you to go to the museum's bookshop as well, where you can order your copy from there as, as well. And I believe we have signed copies too. Um, the Man from the Future: The Visionary Life of John von Neumann. Um, it's out there. It's waiting for you to pick up and read or download. Um, I know it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, if everyone, please just give him a virtual round of applause or a thumbs up to show your appreciation, please. It's been fascinating. I've enjoyed enjoyed it myself. Um, thank you so much for joining us and, and, and good luck with the. Thank you. The thank, thank you. Very, thank you very much, everybody. And uh, if you've got some more burning questions, I am on Twitter uh, rather more than I should be um, at um, Onano, A-N-A-M-Y-O. So hopefully see you there. Thank, thank you, thank you all. And thanks for the great questions too. Thank you, thanks for your time. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you.